here's the interesting thing. Bad outcome number three, compromise. And she's like, I know we're encouraged to think that's a good word, but really compromise is just partial victories and partial acquiescences. You haven't gotten anything. At best, you get a partial victory. She said, the only reason you should ever gather around a table is co-creation. The Fred Minnick Show is brought to you by Michter's and 291 Colorado Whiskey. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Fred Minnick Show. Got a special guest in the studio with me, the author of The Power of Giving Away Power. Matthew Barzin with me. How are you, sir? Doing great. Good to see you. Thanks for having me into your awesome studio. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's good to have you here. And... You know, some backgrounder, um, you're the publisher of, uh, of Louisville Magazine. You're a uh, proud Louisvillian and member of, the, member of the Brown family of Brown Foreman. And, uh, and then you did a little something for uh, our country and served as a United Kingdom ambassador. Just a few things in your resume. Well, yeah, and I mean, I adopted Louisvillian and adopted in the sense of I'm an outlaw within the Brown clan. Right. And I married, uh, my lovely wife, Brooke, is, uh, is part of that family. Now, do they so treat I, you differently at, at, um, at pig roasts and, and Christmas parties? Or I'm picturing the, 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 the pig roasts. I don't know. Uh, no, they're very well. They, part of the reason I am in Louisville, we are in Louisville, is that it is it is such a welcoming, at its best, it is such a welcoming place. Um, See, Campbell always felt like he was the outsider because he grew up in Canada. Well, that'll do it, <laughs> right? But I mean, he's a proper family member. I'm an outlaw, but uh, but I'm treated. Uh, it's a very welcoming family, and um, it's not unique to that family, uh, but. And I talk about this in the book a little bit, but like that welcoming spirit, I think is certainly, I really grew up in Boston and I love Boston, uh, but I think it is safe to say while being slightly undiplomatic that Boston is not known for its welcoming That is culture, true, especially right? to uh, opposing teams. Oh right? yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, the opposing teams, they, they're not as bad as Philadelphia, but they're pretty bad. They're pretty bad. Yeah, pretty it's, bad. That, it's that whole East Coast thing now. Yeah. So uh, tell us about the book. You you know, we've known each other a few years, yeah. and um, any anytime somebody writes a book, I try to do my best to help them. Thank you, because it's so. I, well, you know what it's like. You've written yeah. so many. How many are you up to now? I, I I've written seven that are published. Wow. I've got a couple that haven't been published. Okay, but That's it impressive. but it's it is an, a it's a task. Yes, know? yes, and then. Uh, and then, it, and but by the time it comes out, you know, you've actually stopped writing, or I have stopped writing it. I'm right. sure it's true with you, like long ago. It just right. takes a long time to actually physically get this thing out, and mm -hmm. a lot of wonderful people who make that happen. Um, and so, it itself is kind of a collaboration, and the book is about working together um, to build big things. And I haven't had a chance to read it, but my my friend uh, Heather Kleisner, you know well, Love Heather. Uh, she she gave me some some cliff notes on oh, it. Oh, okay. How did she sum it up? Well, I need to get better at this. She so. well, she told me that everybody needs to read this, especially in our time right now. You know, because it's about it's about how to really incorporate society, you know your community into your to your leadership. You know your yeah. You know so. Uh, can, d give us well, give us a story of the book and why you wrote it. Well, let me come at it um, a different way. This actually isn't in the book, but it's how I think about it. And here we are. What are we? August 2021. Um, if you think uh, this is a very easy guessing game, but if there were t two cars in the parking lot mm -hmm. and you had to guess which is the Democrat's car and which is the Republican's car. Uh, they're identical. I mean, I'm not going to make it easy. It's not like a mm -hmm. red a mm -hmm. Ford 150 and a blue Prius or something, right? It is um, identical cars, one bumper sticker each, and each bumper sticker only has one word on it, mm -hmm. okay? Car number one says freedom. Mm -hmm. Car number two says together. Mm -hmm. You would guess correctly. Uh, yeah, I would guess the Republican would be freedom. Yeah. And uh, the Democrat would be together. Now, you're younger than I am, but we're not too far apart. In our entire our entire adult lifetime, I think you can 
we can think of the debate in our country anyway mm -hmm. between the freedom crowd and the together crowd. Mm -hmm. And COVID has brought this out. So at the extreme, the freedom folks have taken that one word to its extreme of freedom from, just leave me the heck alone, mm -hmm. right? The together crowd have taken it to its extreme of um, total togetherness. Mm -hmm. um, and in that context, it's sort of like, just tell me what the heck to do. Mm -hmm. And when they use the term herd immunity, it almost sounds like they think we're a herd of cattle or something. It's sure. weird. Yeah. So what I think is that, and I appreciate freedom and I appreciate together, what I think we really want and what we certainly really need in this country and the best idea of America that we fall short of all the time, but it is a great idea, what we want is freedom together. Yeah. Not some mishy, middle of the road compromise between freedom and together, like fully free through and with one another. And that's what this book's about. Now, you um, you served as the ambassador to the United of the United States of the United Kingdom and to Sweden and to Sweden. And by the way, which posting was better? Which had better food? Oh, I am the father of twins. So I just am like instinctively and a, a recovering <laughs> diplomat. So I just I don't do favorites. Uh, I loved the, I love both experiences. Very different. Uh, whiskey in both uh, traditions, really good food. I mean, Sweden's famous for, I loved, I fell in love with herring for breakfast, which is weird. It's or like I, smoked or pickled or? Uh, I like the mustard. Okay. Yeah, pickled mustard, herring or curry flavored herring. Um, so I, and then they had this weird thing that like divides the country because most sweets probably don't like it called sir strumming. Mm -hmm. And I actually made a YouTube video, which viewers can check out. And it doesn't have uh we didn't ever promote it for reasons you'll see, but but I encourage my then very young children, like age, I don't know, nine, nine, and five, to eat this stuff. And it is, um, uh, one of the embassy employees, this great guy named Bjorn, uh, he grew up in Sundsvall, north of Stockholm, and they are, they're very proud of their surf drumming. Now, I called it rotten fish to our kids, and he was very offended. He's like, it is not rotten, it is controlled spoilage which is also kind of rotten, but it's a, it's a positive <laughs> way of thinking about something as rotten. And then the way he, he, he convinced me, he's like, well, would you call blue cheese, which I happen to love, mm -hmm. would you call blue cheese rotten? And I would say no. Right. It's controlled spoilage. So anyway, that's what you do. You take this fish and it's fermented and it's disgusting. And I mean, it is outlawed, I think, in some apartment buildings because if you open the can of this stuff, it, it, it smells a lot it's like death. Yeah. It's absolutely terrible. But we tried it. We got our kids to try it, and we made a short video of it. And um, yeah, so that sounds like a good reaction video. Yeah, it's uh, anyway. But that was a long-winded answer to. Uh, I love both places. Yeah, they both have great food. I made a huge diplomatic faux pas in the UK. Uh, I was on the record in some interview, and um, I said something insulting lamb and potatoes, and it was it's a really stupid thing to do to insult anyone's national dish, you know, yeah. or regional dish. And I didn't really mean to, but anyway, the point was done, lesson learned. Yeah, I mean, you you, you attack hamburgers in the United States. I mean, yeah, just dumb. you're gonna get in trouble. So, exactly, yeah. so learn, uh, you know, roll with it, learn to like. So I learned to like bourbon, you know, coming to Kentucky. And you're also a big rum fan. I'm uh, a big rum fan. I, I pulled out rum a couple, curious. couple bottles for you. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I was, I brought you a bottle of Foursquare uh, a couple times ago. Premise, and I think. Or, you, that, or how you do got, you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you would have had the premise. Which uh, I love. Now, now we have the uh, Principia. Ooh. And then the 2008 vintage. Oh, thank uh, you. So we've got some uh, we, we got Would some you explain something to me? I've been quoting you ever since. I hope I got it right. Can we check it here? On sure, the absolutely. Okay. Because I was saying how I'm uh, starting to learn to like rum in addition to bourbon. And then I started rattling off some of these aged, you know, 12 years, 23 years. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. All those have added sweetener at the end. Right. Added back. And is that, yeah, uh, is a that lot. like a dirty little trade secret that they do? Yeah. So rum is a, and, and there's also, there's also like a, a political angle to this. Uh, so uh, rum historically was 
distilled molasses aged in wood. I mean, that was it. And there's different ways to get it there using pot still, column still, blending the two. But Jamaica Barbados, you know, kind of the, you know, the the best at, at doing that that style and creating kind of a heavier, thicker style. Uh, then you'd have like, uh, say, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, um, you know, distill at like higher proof points. Um, the same with Cuba. And they would, you know, cut it. Uh, they would filter out the they would filter out the the color in some circumstances to make it clear, but those would be that would be kind of like a Spanish style, and it would would not have anything to it. Well, in Venezuela, Dominican Republic, um, and a lot of blenders around the world, they add uh, sugar that flavoring, so their distillate can be just god awful. But they will add a they will add flavoring to kind of make up you know to kind of compensate for uh, for the distillate. Now they will argue that it's a part of their heritage. That's how they've always made rum, and in some cases they they are right. But you know that is what's happened uh, there. There's also the situation in rum where they do not there. You see a number on the bottle, and you know your mind is trained to think that. 23 means it's 23 years old oh. when in fact they just put 23 on there and it's like not even close to 23 years old so i've been falling for this yeah, yeah. all yeah. right and then 23 so, happens to be my lucky number is it really yeah mm. it's my birthday three, three is mine really yeah that and as an old fraternity thing i get like i was the third in my p- pledge class so it's a weird, wow. weird fraternity thing yeah, but uh, maybe uh, we should go deeper on that. <laughs> well, uh, what well, no, we're surrounded no, no, no. by all this amazing yeah, uh, so we, alcohol. We are surrounded by a lot of good stuff. I was corrected early on when I moved to Louisville 20 years ago. I made the great mistake of saying, um, I forget what I called it, hard alcohol or something like that. Oh, liquor, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is like if you're in the business, which my wife's family is, is like a known, like it's a disparaging way to refer yeah. to. And so I, I realized my mistake. Um, or I was made aware of my mistake, and I was like, "All right, well, t- you know, what what should I call it?" And they're like, "Well, distilled spirits." Or da da. I was like, "Okay, great." Yeah, and I think I, I I think every industry has like their their PR terms they like, you know, and um, you know, when I wrote a book about uh, beef, you know, they started changing the word. Um, they started changing the word from uh, uh, packing plant to harvesting plant. You know, I mean, it just, oh well, I, I made an, another a big industry in louisville you probably wouldn't have made this mistake i did i said fast food big no no oh, quick service qsr yeah. quick yeah. service <laughs> restaurant so then i met a guy who was uh head of a big healthcare company here in town i screwed up twice so i said uh hey i don't want to make the mistake what is the euphemism uh the politically correct euphemism for healthcare? and he paused and he deadpanned and he goes uh you just said it <laughs> isn't that good health health care yeah well, let's get uh, let's get to this. Uh, well, you want to start on the rum? I know you. Yeah, I'm in your capable hands. I'm in your. So capable I wanted hands. I wanted to to do. Um, go ahead and let's see if I can get one of your glasses there. So this is Foursquare 2008. Now, I have never had a bad Foursquare. Full transparency. Okay. And. I've only had one and it was delicious, so I'm I feel the same way. They are so this is a twelve year in uh, aged in former bourbon barrels. Ooh. I think I bought this last year. You know who has a lot of four square in their uh, in their stores? Kroger. Kro- really? Kroger in, in Kentucky is like one of the best places to buy four square. That's really good. I'm an old town guy. Here we go. Yeah, I love old town liquors. Gordo's the best. I'll say. He's a good farm service brat. He grew up. No, did he really? Yeah. yeah. All right, when I'm, I'm watching you. I mean, you're the pro here. Oh, well, we're just. I was just going to turn right to it. I'm, yeah, you, you're getting in there. Well, that's good. That is delightful. How's that for a non-committal tasting word? Delightful. Hints, um, hints of delight. I, I don't think you can fake delightful. Okay. You know the one the one if you want to be non-committal is 
Oh, that's interesting. Oh. Yeah, if you hear if 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 if, if you're a spirits oh, yes. maker and I say, "Oh, that's interesting." You know, you're like, "Oh, crap." You know, he really? Like, yeah, that's the one. It's like being told you're nice after a first date. Oh, that's yeah. the worst. Yeah. Right, but then right I, I mean, I have a bit on, you know, I'm glad I'm married cuz my friends who are single or di- just divorced and getting out there, I don't know how in the world anybody dates anymore you have to have an app you have to there's all these protocols before you meet in person it, it is it is a strange time yeah to be in that world how long you've been married you've been married for i've been married a long time yeah. uh t- i mean i should a long time a wonderful long <laughs> 1999 so coming up on 22 <laughs> years uh mm. but i remember my uh, my wife's late father, Owsley Brown, who this bottle is about, we'll talk about that later, was a wonderful father-in-law, and we lost him way too soon. He died yeah. at age 69, yeah. and uh, he was such a great uh, mentor to me. Uh, but I remember when I, I, I was living in San Francisco, and I'd gone out on a blind date with his daughter, Brooke, who's now my wife, um, and then we fell in love, da 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 and I was gonna ask her to marry me. So I thought I was doing the polite thing. So I called him to ask permission. And he granted it, which was the great part, but he did make a point of saying, this is very unusual to do this on the telephone. And I was like, a, I was working in the internet business. I thought it was so polite that I hadn't emailed him. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> that I had actually called. So I thought this was very formal. Um, but then he revealed, I think this is true, and I said, oh, well, when you asked for your father-in-law's hand, you know, his daughter's hand in marriage, did you do it in person? He said, I did do it in person, but I did it after I had asked her. And I was like, oh, well, big difference. Well. I think on the phone before counts at least as much as in person after the fact. But if um, not viewers more. can decide. If not more. Thank you. So I got, um, I went up to, to my father-in-law, Charles, Dr. Inglesher, and they were in the process of moving and he was surrounded by all these moving boxes. And I was like, this is the worst time to ask because he's going to ask me to help him move and I won't be able to say no. Ooh, yeah. And I, you, you, you were a, you know, there's a saying like, you know, you're, you know, you've got a friend if they'll help you move. Yeah, well, yeah, then if yeah. that's the case, I've never been anybody's friend because <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst experience. In I, human this existence. is a thing we have in common. I mean, I would do many things for friends, helping them move, or like walking their dogs. That was just a big one. It's like, too much because you got to pick up the poop, you know. Yeah. Or at least a know. good, a good citizen would pick up the poop. Most a lot of people. Just no, we're, I've, I've gotten. I've been well trained in that regard. Um, of course, now if you don't if you don't pick up poop, they'll um, they're they're going to uh, there'll be a camera of, of you somewhere on. Yeah. Next well, door it's a good and, example, maybe a little earthy, but uh, of freedom together. Yeah. Right? Like, hey, I get it. We could we could all just do our own thing. We could all like voluntary compliance because you know, is a powerful thing. Because eventually you step in the shit. This is true. And eventually is you true. step in it. Uh, with that being said, we'll uh, now go to the uh, the Principia. All right. What should I be looking out for comparing these two? Well, I, I got to be honest. With you. I don't I don't think I've tasted this one, so I don't know who opened it in my office. Um, and is color a thing with rum? I mean, should we yeah, be looking they, at that? Yeah, they can or? add coloring. Okay. Uh, so this is um, so a couple things here. One, you can see this is this is a bottle that I picked up in my travels because mm-hmm. you can see it's uh, the the label is in um, is in like UK standards. Ah, the way not it proof. Yeah, or, yeah. So that's one little thing. But all right, so this guy is. Uh, Distilled in 2008, bottled in 2017. Uh, one of 5,400 bottles. I don't. I don't remember getting. I don't remember tasting this. I feel like. Hmm. And I feel like I'm saying it right, but they do all these like words that are Roman origin or something. Oh. And you know. You know, when there is a when there is a word that I haven't practiced, you know, sometimes I can butcher it. So, Richard, if you're hearing this, and I yeah, put, fix it in post. I, right? I, I'll you know I will. You'll How hear about Principia? The, it might be Principia. Is it Principia? Could be, but I mean, look, I didn't take Latin. Um, 
Yeah. And so I could be wrong. You know, YouTube is great mostly for a lot of reasons, but you can search how do I pronounce whatever, and they have these yeah. very earnest web guys who That's right. tell you, but yeah. they have the prankster ones. Yeah. Ooh. And they look identical. I bet you. And they're name. hilarious. I but bet, if you I get bet the your wrong name, one, your name's probably up there. In, in, oh, in I the, doubt it's worth covering. It is pronounced Barzan, which is tricky, but I learned after 50 years, well, I guess I wasn't talking at age zero, 45 years to, now I explain it, if I'm writing someone, emailing, as we talked about, I love to email. It's Barzan, like bars and restaurants. Oh, that's a good And one. that kind of, yeah, that works. That works real well. Yeah. Now this is 124 proof, is that right? Yeah. It's not messing around. Is well, that common? What was the other one? The last one was 120 proof. All right. Feel that right in the chest. Little, <clears throat> little Barbados hug right there. Ooh, yeah. All right, this is a treat. So you get um, what? What was the what was the moment like when when Obama asked you to be uh, an ambassador? What was that moment like? It, the moment that comes to mind was um, well, I didn't I didn't really know what the job was. I had this kind of idea from movies that it was like such, just one big giant cocktail party, and we've just got, I love cocktails as much as the next person, but. Um, <laughs> I thought it was something that like really old people did at the end of their careers. And at the time I was in my mid thirties. And so, but there was a wonderful new friend of mine at the time, a guy named Walter Kansteiner who had worked for Colin Powell. He was a real pro. He knew the state department. He described what the job was. And I was like, oh, that's actually interesting. Um, and my late father-in-law, Owsley also knew a lot about it. He had spent a lot of time uh, at the Pentagon earlier in his career. So he knew about the foreign service. Um, and, so anyway, I was asked, and then I, I came in to see newly elected President Obama in the West, in the Oval Office. And I was a, um, like many who were watching this, I bet a fan of the West Wing TV show, mm -hmm. dating myself. But uh, anyway, so I'd seen, I'd never been in there before, but it looked just like it did uh, in the movies and on TV. Um, and we chatted for a little bit, and then I sat down on the couch, and he sat in that chair in front of the fireplace, mm -hmm. and I... Uh, I really only had one question, so I just sort of blurted it out. I was like, Mr. President, what, uh, which was fun to call him Mr. President, Mr. President, um, what advice would you have for a first time diplomat? And I remember it like it was yesterday. And I sat there and I had a little uh, moleskin trendy notebook and I had my pen and I was ready to write down all his pearls of wisdom. Uh, and he sort of looked up for like kind of a long time before saying anything. And he said, well, Matthew, listen. and and. I thought to myself, like, yes, sir, that's why I've come all the way from Kentucky. Like, I am ready to listen to all your pearls of wisdom. But that's all he said. And it took me, like, an awkwardly long time to realize that his advice was listen. It wasn't right. listen to all my great advice. It was listen. And so I really tried to do that when I served in Sweden. I really tried to do that when I uh, served again in London a few years later. Um, which and now that that term is like so many politicians of both parties uh, go on listening tours, mm -hmm. which are kind of I think often BS. I don't want to sure. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like I think they have the idea in their head of what they want to do, mm -hmm. and then they go around and talk to a bunch of people, and then lo and behold, they decide what they had already decided. Not that kind of listening, like really listening. So one of the things I tried to do in the UK was um, it was one of the only country. It was the only country out of forty surveyed by the people at Pew uh, Research where young people, so these people under 25, had a lower opinion of America than their parents and grandparents. The only country. So I thought, well, okay, we gotta get young people in the UK to engage and, and uh, you know, increase what sure. they, their trust, respect, and understanding of the US. For all our imperfections, like, let's, um, this is important. So anyway, they didn't wanna hear a lecture from someone like me. So I went, and in the end, I ended up going to 200 high schools, 100 kids at a time. So I talked to 20,000 British 18-year-old uh, young women and young men. 
and I would give them a blank card and get them to draw a picture of something that frustrated them about America, and we'd talk about it. And the big issues for them, this is 2013, 14, 15, 16, um, number one, and I made one of those word clouds, you know, so the most yeah, frequently yeah. written cards. So number one issue was guns, number two was racism, and number three was police brutality on the frustration side. What, that was back then? That was back then. Wow. And I remember showing it to President Obama when he came to visit and to Secretary of State John Kerry and all the leaders. I just kind of say, hey, here are what young people are thinking. And there are many things we can take away from that. One of the lessons is that what we think of as foreign policy, or basically what we think of as domestic policy, those three issues, mm -hmm. do not stop at our nation's borders. Other right. people are paying attention and watching what's going on here. So domestic policy in America is foreign policy, whether we like it or not. And we it, can make that distinction, but we do so at our peril because if we really listen, that's what they're frustrated and concerned and confused about. Yeah, just I, as we are. I I have noticed that when I travel um, and I meet with you know business people in other countries, they're far more informed um, about our country's policies than than most people. But I also there there's something to be said about like you know we obviously separated from the UK, you know to to have our own kind of like laws and do our own thing, if you will. And we successfully did so. Do, is it was there any kind of like? Is there a little bit of like? That's the one that got away, you know, when it comes to the United States, with the United Kingdom. Oh, it's so interesting. I mean, we have to do these. Um, every embassy all around the world celebrates July Fourth, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, and we did it in Sweden. It was really fun, and and everyone does it in their own way. It was kind of uniquely awkward to try to do it in the UK because we're celebrating independence from you know right. those guys, these guys. Right. And we had this huge backyard in London, so. We would throw right by the had, Grosvenor House, one of the best whiskey bars in the, the yeah. World, right well, that's where yeah. So the embassy is right next to the Grosvenor House, where I got to have the pre-prohibition uh, amazing bourbon. The team there was amazing, and then our residence is in Gro uh, in uh, Regents Park, which is a little bit uh, removed. But it is, I guess, I, I've been told, and I think it's true. Outside of Buckingham Palace, it is the biggest grounds in London so it's huge and so we would fill up the backyard American style uh, they call it a garden we call it a backyard and we had Duran Duran come and play and squeeze and Bastille we'd have like a big music festival to celebrate uh, independence but one of the points that I would try to make talking to all these Brits about Independence mm -hmm. Day was actually the the, the best and I, I touch on this in the book I mean the, if you go back to July 4th 1776 um any band of revolutionaries can declare independence, right? And they do it all the time. The magic of America and the best idea that we have ever had is interdependence. That's what we tried to figure out in our imperfect constitution. Um, how can we be free together, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing, and that's true within our countries, within the political parties, within states and cities and all that, but also true around the world with diplomacy. How can we build better things together? So that's how I tried to sort of shift what could be an awkward July 4th moment. Yeah, it, it, you know, the, the, the point about about guns being an issue, that is one of the, that's one of the, the hallmark, you know, pieces in the Bill of Rights. And it's the, the, the least uh, descriptive in the, in the Constitution. <laughs> Uh, well, because, you know, and it, it, so I would say this to these young kids because they and they not only do they know the issues that we're struggling with here, they know our Constitution. I mean, we would do a little trivia like, OK, right. you know, First Amendment, Second Amendment. And um, and so we talk about it. And, and part of our national story around guns is that we won independence from the UK with guns. Yeah. And so that's core to a history and b to the story we tell ourselves about the history. And so I just wanted them to understand the history and the difference, because we are very different. Um, and I wasn't trying to win an argument with them. You you just wanted to know where Just where give context were. and no. talk about our history. Um, and, uh, I mean, we the people, mm -hmm. you know, when it was written was we the white male Protestant landowning people, small circle. And then I would just show expanding circles. Like, we yeah. have at our best, keep expanding the circle of who's included in we the people. And... I would draw this little diagram, and I was like, look, I may make this look neat and pretty, and it isn't. It's a struggle at every turn, but that's how you should think about America. And this is what we're struggling with now, all these other issues they brought up, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and we are better for, and this all gets back to whiskey. Yeah. And the way I would do it, and, and it was uh, my wonderful uh, late father-in-law, Owsley, when I first moved here, um, I was trying to get up to speed on bourbon. We hadn't yet met. Um, mm-hmm. And he said, okay, three things to make bourbon. Step one, fermentation. Okay, great. And at the end of that, you have beer, but not the kind you drink. I was like, okay. Step two, distillation. You know, uh, in pursuit of something higher and stronger, you're getting smaller and more refined. I was like, okay, great. He said, but look, if you stop at the end of uh, stage two, uh, you have basically vodka. And he said, you can make vodka in an afternoon. And he said, in order to get whiskey, you need to do that third thing. And then I thought I could get it right. I was like, aging. And he's like, no, close. It's not just time. It's time in a barrel, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> expanding and contracting, expanding right. and contracting. And so that's maturation, not just aging. And he said, that's what gives bourbon color, character, and complexity. So this was obviously a lesson in whiskey. But I dined out literally and figuratively on that explanation for my whole time overseas because no matter what the gathering is, you can use that uh-huh. as a way to talk about just about anything. And what I would say to these young kids, and granted, you know, eight, they're all sort of 18, and that's the legal drinking age there, so it felt okay, um, that agreement and disagreement, right, is totally healthy, like rain and sun. Like, we need that to get color and character and complexity into our relationship. Let's not like do fake smiles and fake agree with each other and be overly polite. We gotta mix it up and that's healthy and we shouldn't be scared of disagreement and agreement or gratitude and resentment. All of these things are kind of like the whiskey going in, pulling uh, flavor and stuff and color in and out of the wood. Yeah, in, you know, the, the, to the point of like disagreement, you know, we, we are in a place now where uh, there, there's n- almost no compromise happening, you know, and so, it's so, so the the extreme points of view from both sides is dividing our country in in a very bad way right now. It's 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 kind of scary because no one wants to wants to compromise. And my whole point with people is. Sit down and have a bourbon with someone you don't agree with politically and, you know, see if you can see that eye on something. I love that. Needless to say, I love that idea. But one of the things when you do read the book and I encourage you to do it, there's this amazing I've been reading your um, great book on the women of whiskey. I butchered the title. What is it? What's whiskey women? Sorry, whiskey women. Oh, yeah. Whiskey women. (laughs) Um, Whiskey women. I love that. And thank you. It's a treasure, Um, even though I butchered the title. And you bring to life a lot of amazing women who I'd never heard of, whose stories are really inspiring. I try to do the same in this book. And there's a there's a amazing woman named Mary Parker Follett, who is the subject of the third chapter. And she is like a hundred. She was writing 100 years ago. as America and the world was coming out of a global pandemic, Mm -hmm. everywhere she looked, she saw racial, social, economic division, raging debates about the power of big business, raging debates about government overreach and overregulation, right? Sounds Mm -hmm. awfully familiar. And she taught, and this picks up on your point about compromise, she said, look, those, all those issues can seem overly big and daunting, but we can actually do something about them beginning at our next meeting, like tomorrow or today. And she said, wherever people are gathered around a table, whether it's on Zoom or a real table, um, Zoom is my addition. She didn't talk about Zoom. But- It'd been cool if she did, though. It'd be very cool. She said, um, uh, and by the way, just as a quick backtrack, Peter Drucker is someone who maybe viewers and watchers here have heard about. Uh, He's probably the most quoted leadership business guru of the 20th century. He reveals Um, And he was actually picked as all the business gurus, Harvard Business School, asked, hey, all the gurus around the world, who's your guru? And they picked Peter Drucker, number one. He's a guru's guru. He reveals towards the end of his life that he had a guru, and it's this woman, Mary Parker Follett. So she's the guru's guru's guru. Um, Most sought after speaker of her time 100 years ago. Um, And she makes the point that we can do something about this division beginning at our next meeting. And she says there's four possible outcomes of a meeting and only one of them is worthwhile. 
bad outcome number one, you try to win the meeting. Mm-hmm. And she's like, so Fred, you'd come in, you try to win it. She's like, why right. do you invite anyone else to the meeting? Bad outcome number two, you acquiesce. You're like, oh, Matthew seems super fired up. Just let him have his way. Mm-hmm. That's no good because you're denying the group of a unique perspective, namely your own. Here's the interesting thing. Bad outcome number three, compromise. And she's like, I know we're encouraged to think that's a good word, but really compromise is just partial victories and partial acquiescences. You haven't gotten anything. At best, you get a partial victory. She said, the only reason you should ever gather around a table is co-creation, to build something together. And we all know that feeling in any group of any size. When you actually build something together, make something together, it might be make a determination, make a whiteboard doodle that turns into a plan. It doesn't matter. Mm you've contributed something to that. It is forever part of you. You are forever part of it. And magic happens in those moments, even if it seems mundane. And that's what I think is so lacking, to your point, in our current political discourse, is we have to be able to make things. Sure. Um, And you can make laws, you can make regulations, you can make all sorts of things. And the act of making something together builds trust, respect, and understanding mm-hmm. as a byproduct of hard work together. And we misunderstand this sometimes. And I think we were talking about sports earlier on in this discussion. Um, and there's a bathroom somewhere on Route 95 between Boston and New York. And someone scribbled on the, next to the mirror, Yankees suck, right? which I agree. And then <laughs> someone scrawled it out and wrote, Red Sox suck. And this goes on and on. Scroll, scroll, scroll. So it's like this much of the bathroom wall is this rant, right? Back and forth. Red Sox suck, Yankees suck. And uh, I promised my wife I wouldn't swear, but I don't think suck is not. We're okay. No, it's a Red Sox suck. Okay, we're fine. Then a guy comes in. I assume it's a guy. It's a men's room. But he comes in with a green Sharpie, and he circles the entire rant and says in his green Sharpie, and we all love baseball. Now, I think that's true, but I don't think Mr. Green Sharpie settled anything. And in fact, I think if you went back to that men's room, you would see some colorful commentary about what Mr. Green Sharpie could do with his pen. Because there's something kind of condescending in that, and we all love baseball. Yeah. So here, and, and so that's where I think this sort of freedom and together that if total togetherness isn't what we want and that sort of like group hug, kumbaya, I, and I, I appreciate that sentiment, that doesn't really settle it. So here's what I would propose we should write on that uh, men's room wall that, of course, I think could apply to the politics, which is not to deny the very real differences between Red Sox fan and Yankees fan, so to speak, or between Republican and Democrat. Mm-hmm. Not to be like, ooh, group hug, we all love baseball. Like, we all love America. That would be the thing to say, yeah, okay, but what if we wrote up, and this is kind of geeky, so sport, people who don't follow sports may lose this, um, but if you wrote on the wall, should the American League eliminate the designated hitter? Now, there is a vibrant discussion to be had in which Red Sox and Yankees fans aren't hopelessly and tribally have their minds pre-made up on that subject. They have to think through, work through, and you may find Red Sox and Yankees fans agreeing that that's a good idea. Different, you know, you get a different right. configuration of people trying to think through and work through that issue. And that's what um, we need to find more opportunities. And we have to bring to those engagements sort of what I think are the lost habits of interdependence, the lost habits of co-creation and making things together. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I like that. You still, you still, we still have the issue of like, you know, getting those people who essentially, for lack of better phrase, hate each other in a room to co-create something is really hard right now. And, and I, I mean, some of these, some of these politicians on both sides, you know, they get huddled around some reporters and they start going off and it's like, this is just. This is not constructive at all. And sometimes sometimes I wonder if 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 politicians don't actually don't if they actually don't benefit from us being divided, um, you know, because it 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 keeps their constituents in a constant set of anxiety, you know? 
It feels that way sometimes. I, I, I can see what you're saying. I, I, I think they do, the ones I know from both parties, do miss making things. Hmm. Um, it's, more, it's just so much more gratifying to, to make a piece of legislation together. But to your earlier point, I agree. It is hard to imagine, you know, Republicans in our current environment sitting down at whatever level, federal, state, city, and doing what I described, but 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 I don't think impossible. But here's a harder test, I think, or, or, or that that isn't so easy. Like, oh, that's impossible. Just pick. Uh, I'm a Democrat. Just pick the Democratic side. What people know who know Washington is some of the most nasty fighting is within the tribe. Sure. Right. So just imagine. And so what we'll do in Washington is like, oh, the State Department people don't trust the Department of Defense or the Treasury people. Right. We just keep defining us and them at whatever scale we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem beyond hope to imagine what if just the Democratic members of the administration would conduct a meeting where they weren't trying to win and lose all the time, right? Because here's the weird part. I would, I would do this with these young people or any age. I'd be like, if you have 100 people gathered or 10 people, you say, um, how many people here like to lose an argument? No one ever raises their hand. Okay. So why are we in the argument winning business, right? Then you ask 10 people, what's the opposite of winning? And they'll all in unison say losing. And that's just kind of a trick to get them warmed up. And then you say, Fred, you say, okay, I agree. What's the opposite of winning and losing? Then something really interesting happens, which is nine out of 10 of us say, I don't know, not <laughs> playing, <laughs> sitting it out, right? Sure. One in 10 of us says playing living, laughing, learning, all the other things we do in life that don't lend themselves to winning and losing. And here's the optimistic part. The downside is that nine out of 10 of us think if we're not winning and losing, we are doing nothing. Yeah. But once we hear the one in 10 who say playing, all the other, you know, being, um, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, right. Because they realized that we talked about dating and, and, and both being so grateful for being married to wonderful people. Mm -hmm. You do not win a marriage. You do not win parenting. You do not win a career. You do not win distilling. You do not win, but you might win prizes along the way. You do not win a career. But certainly in the case of marriage, if you try to win one, you may very well lose it. Yeah. You know, and so that, once we realize that and we get out of that, what I call this sort of pyramid mindset in the book of, of up and down, in or out, ranking, rating, sorting, sifting, that whole world is a type of order. It's just not the only type of order. There's another way of thinking your, about yourselves and those around you, which back to the July 4th, 1776, um, and you'll hear about it, and we don't have time to get into it, but the story of the making of the national logo, which we have an image for, you see both of them on the back of a dollar bill. Mm -hmm. The pyramid, which we put on the back of the logo, which symbolizes sort of in, out, up, down, hierarchical power. We have this other image that you've seen a million times and we just look through it, which is called the constellation, which was chosen to be the expression of this famous, we talked about Latin earlier, e pluribus unum, we know that one, mm -hmm. from many one. We weren't supposed to think of it that, if you look on the back of the dollar bill, right above the eagle's head, it says from many one, and right above that motto is 13 stars. And so we were supposed to think of it as like from many stars, one constellation. And that's a very different, I think very powerful way of thinking about you and the people around you. You're a star, Fred, I'm a star, you're a star. Now how do we wanna connect in new and open-ended ways to make something more useful and more powerful than we ever could by ourselves? That's kind of the constellation mindset. And I think we have to do more shifting to that to deal with the issues you're talking about and escape this pyramid mindset. Oh. Uh oh. Empty glass. Empty glass. I was gonna say I was gonna read the the book title and pour some whiskey here. The book the book is called The Power of Giving Away Power. Matthew Barzin's the guest, and uh, we're gonna drink some Old Forester here now. This is a this is a bottle special to you. You got a story behind it. I got a it. quick story. So this bottle here, which we're not opening, this was the one made in honor of my late father-in-law, Asley Brown the second. And so we're not opening that. And for that, those for those listening and not oh, watching yeah, this yeah. on the YouTube, this is um, a beautiful label. Uh, it's got Asley Brown there. Of course, Asley passed away a few years ago at the age of sixty-nine, 
and when he passed, it was a it was a sad sad day for uh, for American whiskey, and he's an incredible business mind, and is the reason why we have Woodford Reserve. Uh, he's the reason why uh, Jack Daniels is the world's number one selling uh, whiskey. He's the reason for so many things. To include my guest today's, uh, you know, he was a mentor for you. So he was, and I got to, I got baptized later in life, which is a story we don't have time to get into. But I got to pick my own godfather, and I picked oh, Owsley to be wow. my godfather, which wow. was cool. Um, and uh, so he meant a lot to me. His wonderful son is my dear brother-in-law, Owsley Brown the third, and he before so uh, big Owsley as we call uh, died ten years ago this September, and. Um, young Owsley, my brother-in-law, they were doing single barrel Old Forester stuff. He went out and picked out a barrel. He was really excited. And then his father died and he had lots of other things to worry about. And he sort of forgot that he had picked it. And then just, I think a year ago or something, his cousins, um, Campbell, you mentioned earlier, and mm-hmm. Garvin, um, uh, wonderful leaders of Brown Foreman, they, they discovered this barrel and it's like, this is going to be amazing. I mean, it's been sitting here forever. No one found it. We can maybe have it. And then they see OB written on it really gently. And they're like, maybe it's Big Owsley's. Oh, let's, we have to go ask uh, OB3, as they call them, if it's his. And they sort of secretly and funnily be like, I hope it's not. And then it's ours. But they were wonderful gentlemen. They asked Owsley. He's like, yeah, 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 that's mine. I totally forgot about it. So long story short, they pulled it out. They made it now, and so you're about to have it. And I would love to know what you think about it, and to put you on the spot, what characteristics okay, you, you want, think it has. You want me to break this down? I just love the story, and I love the whiskey, but you know this stuff. So when 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 was this uh, bottled? Oh, see now, um, I'd this say a, a year. Ago, I mean, bottled a year ago because this is fairly a, from know, a barrel that he picked. Out. I mean, I think it's. I think I've been sitting there for. Nine years. So the years. the barrel had been in there for an extra eight nine years, something like that. And so the, that would I, get the timing right because if it happened in 2011 and he had, and it's most roughly that time. Most frame. old Forester, most of that whiskey in there was four years old. So this is nine years old then. How how wait, so uh, he picked it 11 years ago? Uh, let's say he picked it. it let's year. say he picked it 10 years ago. Okay, and then and it then got then bottled last yeah. year. So is that 11 altogether? I don't know. So we'll the, have to. We will get the answer for you. So from I'm the gonna, people who know what they're talking about. We're, we're I'm gonna, just drinking it. Let's do it an assumption that this is a, a 15 year old. Oh, okay. Well, because they, yeah, most old forester stuff is four you have years four old. Four, and then you add yeah, so, ten or eleven. So if that's been sitting there, I mean, there's. So like, and maybe I'm overstating. Maybe it. Had, so maybe it's four plus eight. So, so maybe this it's would, twelve. Something and like they that. cut it. And they cut it to ninety proof. Yeah, it's got that classic old foe smell. It's going to make sure they... Yeah, it's, it smells amazing. Wow. OB3 did really good on this one. Really? Tell Holy me what... Cow. Tell him, because he'll listen to this. Like, what... What do you see up front, and what's the finish like? I've met, I've met, by the way, I've met young Asley a, a couple times. Um, I always thought he had the coolest hair, you know, the, yeah. the long hair. You should see it now because he's got the COVID beard thing working. He just turned 52 and he's just like, uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's Inside like, and out. I just like looked at him and I was like, man, he got the best hair. I wish I could grow my hair out like that, you know. And then I. You know what he could get from you though is the Ascot thing because I think he would. Well, he's in California, and he's right? married to a wonderful Argentine. Uh, yeah, and so I think he's got permission because he sort of has that exactly. non-American thing by marriage. I, I promise, my I'm going to start rocking one when I turn sixty. Well, you know, and there's there's no time like the present. You really? Know? Yeah, sure, I mean, because you got to you got to get the you got to get the. And I don't want to be presumptuous there. about you know you never know. But my grandfather was from France. He wore one, so it's a good look. I have. I can. Well, the thing right, about so, but the back thing to the about the here. well, I can't. We, we, We're on I, to ask when, when I when I get on to ask Scots, <laughs> Matthew. Uh, I mean, rookie mistake. You gotta give me a second here yeah, now. Yeah. So right. when Ascots were meant to can be, can I open my focus, please? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. you need the caffeine. I need the caffeine. Another great Kentucky creation. So when you when you look at Ascots, Ascots were meant to be a. Um, they were meant to be like a an under level kind of bow tie or tie tie. They're they're not meant to be fancy. 
And then the... Oh, they're like an undershirt for the neck? Yeah, I mean, pretty much it. Oh, wow. And, okay. Glad I asked. And then um, Gilligan's Island, the the C. Thurston Howell, I think it was oh, name was, God. the character. Yes. He wore an ascot and we kind of gave this rich, jerk, jerky kind of like thing to it. And so, and then Hugh Hefner was like always wearing them. And so they kind of became like this... For a lack of again, lack of a better phrase, it be, kind of became a a token rich asshole look, and then ah. so people started getting uh, wearing bad guys would wear them and like James Bond, and so like it was associated with rich people who did bad things, and in Charles Woodson, NFL Hall of Famer, it, you know he's yeah. a friend of mine, he wears them, and you're kind of like it's it's kind of like getting people to like reclaim, yeah. yeah, it's trying we're trying to get it bring it back, and to this day like. Every single video I post, whenever I do a tweet, people are, and I don't know what it is, but, you know, dudes from like 30 to 50 years old are really offended by me wearing an ascot sometimes. They'll be like, I will never listen, respect your opinion because you're wearing an ascot. I'm like, man, if that is, if that is what you got going on in your life today that you need to comment on a video or on Twitter, you have far bigger problems than me wearing an ascot. And I... I never once in my life um, ever cared about what anyone else would wear outside of like, eh, I like that, I don't like that, but I would never in a million years comment on something like that. Yeah, Just, yeah, yeah. It's so weird. But anyway, so this is so from a from a nose perspective, this does not this does not smell like a typical old Forester. Uh, this smells like King of Kentucky. You know, some of the, so I think I'm right that this is a 15 year old, okay. 14, 15 year old. Uh, so this smells, you know, really bright cherries, cherry pie coming out of the oven. Some cinnamon. I mean, this, this smells like Christmas. Oh, smells like Christmas. That's so cool. And now on the, on the palate. It's touching every inch of my tongue, so it's all mouth coating. It's tickling the roof of my palate. So the first thing I like to do is just to see kind of how it feels, what part of the tongue is it hitting. And this is mouth trenching, mouth coating. It's hitting the roof of my palate. And then after that, it's like a ton of fruit. Uh, so it's just very, very fruity. There's some like, like a Chinese allspice, you know, you can get that nice Chinese allspice powder. So it's got some spice to it, but it's not a baking spice or a, a traditional pepper spice. It's like that particular, you know, spiciness from the, the Chinese blend, you know, if you get like a Whole Foods. Um, and then the finish is just incredibly long. I mean, it's still on the palate, just resonating there. Uh, just like it, it started just all over the, all over the palate. It's incredible. So Young Owsley. You and your your uh, your cool hair. You did a good job here, <laughs> and your generous cousins. And your generous who, who cousins. let them in on the on the existence <laughs> of this thing. And I, I'm shocked that uh, you know Jackie and Campbell would have let this uh, you know go. I think they were a huge part of. It. By the way, I lo- I listened to your wonderful conversation with Jackie. That was uh, oh, she's fun. She was great. What a star. Yeah, she's what amazing. a star in any constellation. Right. <laughs> So when when you uh when there's a big brown foreman huddle together, you got Mac Brown over there that you know he's the head of the Republican Party in in Kentucky. Do you all ever talk politics, or is that a kind of like a forbidden thing? At like, uh, I, I I don't know why I brought it up earlier, but the but the hog oh. the roasted hog party. I don't think I've been invited to the roasted hog party. I don't think there is one. I don't think I'm, there is I, one. Or I or, or I'm it. not on the guest list. Maybe I'm with all the foremans. <laughs> Which I used to get a kick. I always make these jokes. No one. Thank you for laughing. I always try to do that at these gatherings. Be like, oh, I feel, you know, it's like, because there aren't. I mean, or maybe there are, but like they're not in the picture. And so, anyway, it's uh, no, it never gets it never gets a laugh. In, it, in, no, in that's that. that's funny thank to you. every thank you. whiskey historian. Okay. On the Excellent. planet, thank I you. I'm so you. glad we, we would all so laugh much. at that. Uh, uh, Foremans have been ar- around really yeah. since the beginning. So uh, anyway, the Hogwood. No, I don't. Um, well, I, I'm a big believer. I have come to learn that uh, 
no one, as we talked about, no one likes losing arguments. So I don't think I'm in the argument winning business. I don't think that's how hearts and minds and laws, hearts and minds certainly don't change that way. Laws can help sure. change hearts and minds and habits. I'm big into habits and the habits of um, putting people, other people's arguments in their best possible light, an old fashioned world called comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y is a really good word. It's a good habit. We've gotten out of the habit of practicing. It's something that both Asleys we've talked about today are incredibly good at, mm -hmm. and so I've learned from both of them. And you watch that in action, and you think that's a good way. And it doesn't mean papering over distinctions. It doesn't mean not acknowledging disagreement. It's embracing it in a healthy way. Um, I was thinking, you know, right when COVID broke out, um, there was one more Democratic debate. I, I'm probably getting the network wrong, but let's say it was CNN, just to keep it simple. And mm -hmm. they had one more schedule between Bernie and Biden. But the math, this is back March 2020, but I think the math was pretty much over at that point. Like Biden was going to win it. It was just a matter of, you know, when. Um, and COVID was hitting. So the big debate was, should you cancel it or should you continue it? Which is sort of obvious, but it occurred to me, you know, there is another option. And I actually wrote it up and it didn't go anywhere. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about to your earlier question, which is what if you kept the two hour, three hour block on CNN, but you don't have a debate. You have something else and I'll give it a name in a second. Biden shows up, Bernie shows up. You ask Senator Warren to come back, Senator Harris to come back, Mayor Pete to come back. All the people who had been on that stage early but had dropped off at mm -hmm. one point or another, invite them all back and have, wait for it, a discussion. And wouldn't it be neat? And this doesn't seem beyond the realm. And you could say it might be boring television, but I mean, watching the food fight of intra or inter-party stuff isn't exactly riveting television either. But you could have, you know, candidate Biden say, Senator Warren, you think I'm hopelessly middle of the road, mushy on this healthcare stuff. What am I misunderstanding or what am I being naive about, do you think? And she, you know, if you ask someone to constructively criticize your position, you might learn something. They might learn something by trying to see your reaction to it. Right. And right on down the line with all these smart women and men, and you could act as if you were a team that you were trying to get the best ideas and you were trying to make something together. Yeah. That doesn't seem totally far-fetched, and we could actually give the time and space to do that on a national stage like that or just at our next meeting, and that's what I'm trying to spend my time doing more of. Yeah, but that would you would have to have a declared winner at that point, right? Or one an assumed winner, right? You'd have to have an assumed winner at that point because yeah. then it or else you'd be so hopelessly in this win-lose paradigm. Yeah. Now, look, you could still have people jockeying for who, you know, I want you to pick me as VP or I want you to pick right. me. I mean, that's all like part and you could have um a, a spirited discussion where you don't know, and I think President Biden is actually one of his many attributes, is he doesn't have his mind made up in advance. He's a good and natural listener, so he could listen to other people's ideas and mm -hmm. try to integrate them into his own. Um, so that is you know, one something interesting either things, party could do. He, he's, uh, he signed an executive order to look into the alcohol industry's unfair trade practices. So... That's the first time a president has uh, has taken that level of interest in, in the alcohol industry since Reagan. So who knows? He might be really good for, for bourbon, you know? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? So tell me about Focus. Are you part of that? I'm not part. Well, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a fan. Oh, okay. Uh, it was started by it, – it was a co-creation mm -hmm. of uh, – my connection is one of the co-founders, a great guy named Tom O'Grady. Um who backed uh, his business partner, who was, I think, a med student doing the residency at U of L, mm -hmm. who didn't couldn't drink hot coffee doing rounds. Mm -hmm. I'm going to butcher the story, so apologies to the real story. But this is how I it came down to me. And then, so they drink diet soda because they needed caffeine to stay up all night. And they're like, they know that's not great for you, and they don't want to drink that in front of patients. And so they'd end up sort of drinking coffee away and then chugging Lacroix or something. And they're like, I wish you could just have basically caffeinated bubbly water. Um, and then long story short, they developed this, which is, uh, it has the caffeine and L-theanine that occurs naturally in green tea integrated oh, in. Okay. And it's really, so I brought, you got to try it. It's really good. This yeah. is blood orange. Um, 
it's great to drink. And so Tom brought it over to me and I sat there and I love coffee and I love sparkling water. And he's like, I have a product for you. And they make cucumber and lime ouzo and all these different flavors. They just came out with cola and cherry cola, mixed berry, apple. All oh, that's great. Ones. Yeah, that's a really, so I love a lot of them. And there's and, zero calories, so. And no salt, and I don't wanna, I don't know if you ever, but so many sparkling waters have salt in them, like that. Like a sodium. Yeah, yeah, and I don't need more salt, I get it elsewhere. Well, you know, I'm trying to, that for, for what I do, Matthew, losing weight is, um, is not the easiest thing, so I've hired like a, an online coach, or oh, cool. we text all the time about what I can eat, what I can't eat, where my calories are for the day. Yeah. And when I started tracking everything, I was just like, you know, I actually don't eat that badly. I need more protein and all that. But this stuff right here, man, it puts the pound. It can put the pounds on, you know. So now uh, I just it, and so good luck on that journey. I lost thirty pounds. You look good. Thank you. Uh, between Sweden and going to serve in London, um, and changed a lot of things. It was not of general interest, except the one thing I just was like, I'm not not drinking bourbon. Yes. So I kept bourbon a constant and still lost 30 pounds. Now I'm not a well, it's licensed a, uh, right. dietary I, there coach, is, nutritionist, but I, uh, I think that if, one man's story. If I were to give up bourbon, uh, first of all, I would have no profession, probably yeah. lose my identity. Yeah, please don't do that. And I'd be looking in the mirror like, who am I right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I couldn't do that. Thin and joyless. I w exactly. But you're looking great. And so whatever you're doing is working. It's it's starting to pay off, so yeah. we're 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 on the we're on the right track. But you know, there's a there's a few things like you know I'm trying to make sure I don't I don't schedule two tastings in a day, uh, or you know I'm trying to find new ways to relax other than have a bourbon. I've a lim I've all but eliminated social drinking, and so that's the that's the type of stuff that you know, and it takes discipline. I love in do. your line of work you can get rid of social drinking. I was yeah. like, <laughs> do you know what I mean, and like still have. A pie chart that is work drinking. We, you know, the social drinking thing is like, you know, it, it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous from a caloric standpoint because you have one and you have another and then everybody's bringing something over for you to try. Yeah, look around. I so, mean, <laughs> For those of you listening, I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen the YouTube, but like, it's just so beautiful. So I got to come back. I want to bring you one for the shelf. There's no more room. Oh, we but, can make room for you. Really? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to come back with something. I'm going to come back with something fun because this is our only bottle of the Owsley okay. too, so I can't give you that. But I want to come back and bring something fun yeah. to add to this mix. Um, definitely. Well, we we def you definitely have a there's a lot of things out here now. I know you're not a part of like the day to day of Brown Foreman or anything like that, but there's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of changes in the in the past year or two. Are you? Do you ever you know? get in give advice or anything like that to the company uh i am a huge yeah there been i mean we, we had a uh changeover of ceos as you yeah. know a couple yeah. years ago um and it's one of the things that my father-in-law alzi took so seriously when he was ceo because his older brother had served as ceo so they're very good at transitions and long-range planning and it's just sort of part of their culture so they can do it within the family in the case of when my father-in-law took over from his brother or when Paul Varga handed over to Lawson Whiting, mm -hmm. and they take these things seriously. They invest time, energy in doing it. Uh, we just had a change of chair uh, with Garvin uh, Brown, who did such an amazing job for so long, handing it over to his brother mm -hmm. um, in this wonderful way just a few weeks ago. Um, and so there is continuity and change. Oh, and I'm reminded, this is a better visual thing than it is on audio, so I'll try to simulate it here. When you talk about change, uh, my father-in-law had this great uh, example of how to think about it. And he said, um, one of the things people love, he was talking about Jack Daniel's Black Label in this context, but you could apply it to other brands that you love. But that one is so old. Um, and he said, if you ask consumers, what they love about it is that, quote, never changes. Um, and just talk about the packaging here. Um, and he said, now, of course, the truth is, if you showed them a bottle from even just 50 years ago, they wouldn't like it. And then he had two fingers starting off, and he's like, consumers' preferences change. So if you stand still, 
right. you lose them. If you go too far ahead of them, you've changed. If And so if the two fingers are going together like this, the way you appear not to change is to constantly be changing in a very careful and beautiful way. Yeah. So the, And I thought that was lovely because as we talk about politics or we talk about marriage or we talk about diplomacy or any of these things, there's a similar thing going on that mm -hmm. you need to... Um, you know, change can be scary, um, but if you embrace it in that sort of way that you're going with someone traveling, I think that's a lovely yeah. image and not getting locked in to previous things you've said or previous things you've done or overcompensate and leap out ahead. So that's how I think. That's about awesome, it. man. Well, I, I love that. And I, I kind of, um, I, you know, just unnaturally have done that myself, uh, just seeing the change in my world, in the media world. Consumers stopped, uh, let's just say they stopped reading uh, in the way that they, reading stopped being like their main form of whiskey media consumption. Mm. And so I got out of the, uh, for all intents and purposes, I got out of the magazine business. Yeah. I really stopped kind of writing and, um, and I've put all my focus on podcasting and YouTubing and it's like, and it's like people are finding me that don't know, had never heard of me, didn't know anything about bourbon. And, and I, I just, I I'd also don't want to be just bourbon. So I've, I've really, this show is about the conversation, you know, mm -hmm. it's about getting to know people and I've had a lot of incredible guests, but, um, you know, and I don't have industry people on this show for a reason. You okay. know, I, I don't do. Well, I don't, tell me, can you tell me why? Well, I, so I'm also a member of Bourbon Pursuit, and I want that. I w that's where I want like bourbon conversations to be. I want this show to not be a bourbon show, but be to be a music, a sports, an athlete, uh, a business person conversation mm -hmm. over bourbon. Um, and so bourbon is a part of it, but it's not the show. Whereas, like, you know, if it was a bourbon show, I'd be asking you about like what, what warehouse was this in? Uh, what rack was it? Oh, I'd say really deep, really yeah, okay, like yeah. inside baseball. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, and that's and that's what that's what uh, I prior to this journey I had been more accustomed to. Mm. So, so this is um, well, you know, it's yeah, that's what this show is. It's just a conversation. Well, I'm so glad. With so I can be on here because I wouldn't be able to answer any of those other questions about well, let's, let's be honest. Are, when you yeah. when I saw you had a new book out, you know, I had I was like, I got to get Matthew on the show. I got to do. I got to help him out here, and well, this is thank you. this is published by Penguin, published by Penguin, uh, available in in uh, in partnership. It's actually a new la a new part of Penguin. They mm -hmm. did in partnership with Simon Sinek, who some of your uh, listeners and watchers may be familiar with, but a, um, a wonderful author who did start with Why and many other books, Leaders mm -hmm. Eat Last, um, The Infinite Game, and and so on. And he's been uh, a great encourager, collaborator on this project with me, and so uh, he and the folks at Penguin Portfolio helped bring this to life. That's great. And so this is the power of giving away power. Matthew Bars and everybody, make sure uh, you go and get this book however you get your books. But, you know, Amazon, Pals, um, Barnes & Noble, you know, they all have it online for sure. And locally, uh, I'm assuming Carmichael's is Carmichael's carrying it in Louisville. Carmichael's has been great. Um, and then uh, if you go to MatthewBarson.com, it has all the different places you could get it, um, including the wonderful... Um, website that is the collective of uh, all local booksellers like Carmichael's around uh, around the country. How do you feel about doing a signed book giveaway to the listeners? Oh, I'd love for, to do for, that. For those who have made yes. it through the podcast. Come on. Okay, so let's... Uh, Gladly. What, what's a good hashtag? So this is one of the things that uh, guests like to do. They, I ask them to okay. create a hashtag of the show, and then they tweet at us, and then now uh, and and you know then we can do like a drawing out of the tweets. Okay, so the, my, the, uh, I have to come up with a clever hashtag. It's just it didn't have to be. Super doesn't have to clever. be clever. Great. Yeah, it could just uh, be even simple. better. Um, hash. Okay. Well, let's. Um, so we talked. We talked about maturation your, would be weird in this context. Let's not. And, do and that. if someone misspells it, it can yeah, get it can real be funny. Okay. Okay. The whole bunch of words are now out uh -huh. of out of contention. <laughs> <laughs> um, Constellation. How about Constellation? Well, that's a brand, so that's that, weird. Yeah, yeah. Or that's then, a company. And yeah, then confusing then, and, and then people gonna say like, yeah, yeah. "Whoa, Matthew's moving over to yeah, Constellation." Yeah. All uh, right. Okay. Um, 
don't compromise. That's not one word, is that? Um, it's also a brand slogan for somebody. What about the together? What, what was the together one? Uh, freedom together. Freedom together. Okay. What do you think? Thank you. I knew you'd come up with it, Fred. So freedom uh, together. If you've listened to this show all the way through, uh, hit us up on Twitter. What, what's your Twitter handle? Um, at Matthew Barzen. M A sorry M A T T H E W B A R Z U N like November Matthew Barzen and at Fred Minnick just tweet at us um, hashtag Freedom Together f- hashtag Freedom Together hashtag Freedom Together and you'll be in a drawing for a, a free signed copy of the power of giving away power Matthew thanks for coming on the show brother Fred what a joy always Thank a you, pleasure man. hanging out. So fun. Cheers, everybody. Be safe out there. Remember, vodka sucks. (laughs) And you can make it in an afternoon. (laughs) Wasn't that a great episode with with Matthew? And if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, what do you think of the new approach of uh, of the podcast where I have sandwiched the I have sandwiched the uh, interview in between my intro and out, which I normally just have for audio. I was wanted to play around with that a little bit and see what it might be like with um, on on video as well. So trying to do some consolidation and get everything into to one look and feel. And if you're listening to this in your car or your podcast uh, device, if you would go give us a review on however you do uh, your podcasting. It goes a long way with helping the algorithms and uh, pleasing the algorithm overlords. And more importantly, it gives me some feedback. And I love feedback. I, I read the reviews. I try to make improvements where I can. But, you know, I, w- I won't be able to make the improvement unless you tell me to improve it. Or if you like what's going on, man, just let me know. It gives me encouragement to keep on keeping on. But that's going to do it for this week, folks. Uh, Be safe out there. And no licking handrails, no licking trash cans. And remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used for hand sanitizer. Cheers, everybody. (laughs) 